conjectures than the minimal weak gravity conjecture that we discussed yesterday. And the uh, second lecture will probably be mostly about applications to inflation and photon masses, um, but we'll see how I do on, on time. So to remind you, yesterday we talked about the minimal version of the weak gravity conjecture, which was that if I have a U1 gauge theory interacting with gravity, there should be some particle whose mass to charge ratio is smaller than that of large extremal black holes. And one question that one of you already asked yesterday, which is a very good question, is what happens if you have a larger gauge group than just U1? And an answer to that question was given in a paper by Cliff Chung and Grant Remen about five years ago. And the, the argument that they gave is based on assuming that the interpretation of the weak gravity conjecture should be that any extremal black hole should be able to shed its charge by decaying to lighter things. So we saw that if you only had a single uh, U1 gauge field, this condition was required in order for an extremal black hole to be able to decay into two things, one of which would have a larger and one of which would have a smaller mass to charge ratio. It turns out that it's not quite so simple if I have more than one gauge group. So let's think about, for instance, the case of a U1 times U1. You might think that to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture for a gauge group like this, I just need two charged particles, one of which obeys the bound for this U1 and one of which obeys the bound for that U1. But it turns out that's not really sufficient. And the reason is that the form of the extremality bound in this case, in the simplest case where these gauge fields are not mixing with each other, looks like this. So if I have a black hole that carries charges under both gauge groups, there's an extremality bound that depends on um, the square root of the sum of the squares of the charges under the individual gauge groups. And again, this is just because there are electric fields for each of these gauge groups outside the black hole, each of which are storing some energy. But now the claim is that if I just satisfy the weak gravity conjecture for each U1 individually, I don't necessarily allow all the black holes that saturate this bound to discharge. Okay, so that's easy to see. Suppose, let's just look at one sort of toy example. Suppose I give you two charged particles. One of which has charge one to the first gauge group and has mass chosen to saturate the weak gravity bound, and the second of which similarly has charge one under the second gauge group. So if I were just looking at each U1 individually, this would be enough. But the claim is that this is not enough if I have a black hole that carries both charges. And so we can see that. Suppose I have a black hole charged under both um, U1s, which is extremal. And we can just ask what would happen to that black hole if it emitted one of these particles? How would its mass change and how would its charge change? 
So suppose I can just emit this particle and lose mass m1. And similarly, its charge under the first gauge group will decrease by one. It might lose more mass depending on how much momentum this particle carries away, but this is the minimum amount of mass that it would lose. And then we can just work out what happens to the extremality bound um, after I do this, what do I get? If I just evaluate this quantity, is it positive or not? And so if I expand out the square and subtract everything, what you will find is that this looks something like something like this, which is negative. So this decay is not kinematically possible because the black hole by emitting this particle would turn into another black hole that just isn't a good classical solution. It doesn't obey the extremality bound. And so adding these two particles is not sufficient Extremal black holes to discharge. Okay. So this tells us that whatever the, the right condition is for a theory with more than one gauge group, it's going to be more complicated than just saying that you have to individually obey the bound for each gauge group independently. And it turns out that there's a simple geometric criterion to understand what is the correct condition to allow these black holes to discharge. And Chung and Remen formulated this condition in this way. They said, consider the charge to mass ratio of a particle. So we're going to have a set of variables. Let me call them Z, I, J. which are given by the ratio of the charge of a particle in Planck units divided by the mass. And so the index I labels which charge we're talking about, which one of the gauge groups. And the index J labels which particle we're talking about. Okay. So for a given J for a given particle, we can think of this, the collection of ZIs for that J as a vector in some space. And the black hole extremality bound says that if I give you such a vector for a black hole, then when I dot this vector into itself, I get something smaller than one. 
its charge can't be too big for a given mass. Okay. So in the space of these charge to mass ratios, there's some region in which black holes can live. Okay. So this might be a space of many dimensions if we have many gauge groups, but there's some sort of um, ball inside this region that contains all of the black holes. So let me call that the black hole region. Extremal black holes would live on the boundary of this region if we compute using the two derivative action. As I mentioned yesterday, if you have higher dimension operators, the black holes could move slightly outside or slightly inside this region unless there's some um, other physics like a BPS bound that follows from supersymmetry that could force them to live exactly on the boundary of the region. Okay, but what Chung and Remen pointed out is that a condition that allows for um, all of the black holes to be able to shed their charge is to have some set of charged particles in the space not try too hard to draw a three-dimensional picture because it's going to be difficult, but have some set of charged particles such that their convex hole contains the black hole region. Okay, so the convex hole meaning I connect up each of these particles and their antiparticles in such a way as to build a convex space. convex hole should contain the black hole region. Okay. So the example I gave you before where I just had two particles and we saw that not all black holes could discharge is an example where we had two U1s. So the black hole region is the interior of some circle in a plane. And I was choosing to have a particle here and here. They would also have antiparticles here and here. And their convex hole would look like this. And what we were seeing is that if I go in a general direction that doesn't point along one of the axes, the convex hole does not fully contain the black hole region in that direction. So there are these regions that are not contained, and that means the weak gravity conjecture fails. On the other hand, if I had chosen those two particles to have smaller masses, sufficiently far away from the weak gravity bound in a single direction, then the convex hole could fully contain the black hole region and everything would be able to, to discharge. Or we could have a more complicated spectrum. We could have particles carrying both charges. Maybe I could have a picture of something like this. So the minimal version of the weak gravity conjecture doesn't tell you exactly what charges the particles have to have. It just says that whatever those charges are, the masses should be light enough that the convex hull contains the black hole region. Okay, so we saw yesterday that in fact there are examples like Kaluza-Klein theory that obey much stronger properties. If we look at Kaluza-Klein theory, we would just find charged particles living on the boundary of this region in every direction. And there's a reason for that. It's because in this case, the extremality bound coincides with the BPS bound. If you study theories that have scalars, you'll find that the black hole extremality bound can sometimes take a different form. 
So for one example, if I take a string theory and compactify it, I will have both U1s that correspond to pollutes a Klein um, charge or momentum around the circle, but also U1s that correspond to winding, how many times a string winds around the circle. And if you work out what black holes look like in that theory, you'll find that the formula I gave you before with the square root of sum of squares is not the right one. That works for the simple reisner nordstrom case. But in this case, you get a more interesting story where you have these linear regions, so you get kind of a diamond shape. But again, the convex hole condition is the right criterion to impose to ask that everything can decay. And in this case, again, because these are BPS charges, you find that you just have actual states carrying all of these charges in all directions along the boundary. So in everything that I'm telling you, what I'm going to take is my definition of the weak gravity conjecture for a general gauge group is going to be this condition that we have particles carrying charges under the gauge group such that their convex hull contains all possible black holes and allows extremal black holes to discharge. There's another way to formulate the weak gravity conjecture in theories that have scalars. that I want to mention to contrast it with this. So Aaron Palti defined something that he called the weak gravity conjecture with scalar fields. which is that a particle should exist that obeys this inequality. The electromagnetic force should be bigger than the gravitational force coming from the mass plus the scalar force that depends on how the mass changes if I vary the value of the scalar field. And this is a version of what I would call the repulsive force conjecture. So the statement is that the repulsion of electromagnetism should overcome the combined attraction of gravity and scalars. And this is well defined for a single U1, but again, it's not so obvious how to define this if you have more than one gauge group. There's no clear definition of this in the case of more than one gauge group. Um, there's work in progress that I'm doing with Ben Heidenreich and Tom Rudelius, where we're trying to work that out. And the interesting thing is that it seems like this alternative conjecture and this conjecture might both be true. Um, but if the particle's masses depend on the scalar in a different way than the masses of black holes depend on the scalar, these are two different statements. Um, another question you might ask is what happens if for non-abelian gauge groups? We sort of mentioned this yesterday when I showed you the example of charged states in the heterotic string theory. We can take the Qs to be charges under the Cartan generators of the Lie algebra. So the maximal torus, the, the U1s that are contained inside the gauge group. And then we can still apply this condition 
but because the gluons themselves are charged and massless, they're infinitely far out in the space. And so this becomes sort of a trivial condition um, for a non-abelian gauge theory to satisfy. Right, so, so what I'm saying is that I would, I would apply this to any gauge group, um, but what I mean by charge in the, in the non-abelian case was not necessarily obvious, so what I mean by it is take the U1s that live inside the non-abelian gauge group and make this the charge under those. But yeah, I would, I would require this condition of any gauge group, and we'll see that that becomes more interesting when I talk about a different version of the weak gravity conjecture in a few minutes. But yeah, one way to see that, that there should be something related to non-abelian gauge groups is if I give you a non-abelian gauge theory, you can compactify that theory on a circle and turn on a Wilson line for the gauge group around the circle and break it down to the U1s that, that live inside the non-abelian gauge group. And so if the weak gravity conjecture applies on that lower dimensional theory, it should tell you that something had to apply in the higher dimensional theory you started with. Okay, so so far these are all kind of minimal versions of the weak gravity conjecture. Um, this is kind of the right minimal version of the conjecture in the case of a gauge group that's more complicated than U1. But as we were discussing yesterday, the minimal conjectures are maybe not as useful as we would like because they could be satisfied just by saying that black holes get small corrections that push them out of the black hole region defined by the extremality bound on asymptotically big black holes. So what I want to talk about for the rest of this lecture are some extensions of this idea that are much more powerful. And which are motivated by the examples that I told you yesterday. So we talked about kaluza klein theory and we talked about the heterotic string. And we saw that in both cases, we had not just a single charged particle that obeyed the weak gravity conjecture, we had an infinite family of charged particles of different charges, all of which obeyed the conjecture. And this is closely related to another idea which is called the swampland distance conjecture. came from Aguri and Vafa, 2006. And so they had some set of conjectures, um, all of which were related to the fact that known theories of quantum gravity have moduli spaces. So spaces of scalar fields um, with flat potentials. That are protected by supersymmetry. But in fact, similar statements apply even away from the SUSY context. Um, although it becomes harder to make these statements sharp. We saw in kaluza klein theory that we had this radion mode that controlled the size of the circle. Even in a non-supersymmetric theory, that field can be very light compared to the UV cutoff. Um, but for now, let's, let's talk as if the moduli space exists and the scalars are massless because it's easier to formulate everything in that context. So their first conjecture about moduli spaces is that if I give you a moduli space, there exist points that are infinitely far away. So given a point in the moduli space and some positive number, you can find some other point in the moduli space 
whose distance is bigger than that number. So moduli spaces allow you to go infinitely far away. And the distance is defined by the scalar field kinetic terms. There's some metric g i j of phi d phi i d phi j. I guess I didn't say it before, but it's the same metric that appeared in Palti's statement of uh, his weak gravity conjecture with scalar fields when you compute the attractive force on charged objects due to scalars, you need to know the metric on that space. Okay. Now, the next statement that Agori and Vafa made is where things really become interesting and make a connection to the weak gravity conjecture. I say that if I go far away, some distance t away from the point where I started, I will find an infinite tower of light particles whose masses are exponentially small. Masses are going, are of order e to the minus alpha t. Um, for some parameter alpha which is bigger than zero. And it's been further noted, for instance, by Clever and Palti, um, that this number alpha in known examples is always order one in Planck units. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, this means that in quantum gravity, first there are these big moduli spaces. There are parameters that you can, there are scalar fields that let you vary the parameters of the theory and you can vary them by arbitrarily large amounts. But whenever you try to vary them too much, you find that your effective field theory starts to break down because lots of particles are starting to become light. And so if you don't incorporate those particles in your theory, you don't have a good understanding of the physics anymore. So effective field theories seem to break down for super Planckian field values. And we saw an example yesterday in Kaluza Klein theory where we had a scalar the kinetic term that loosely looked like um, in Planck squared d log phi d log phi. Where the masses of the KK modes went like one over phi. So the kinetic term tells us that if we vary this number phi um, by an order one amount, um, that we're going an order in Planck distance in the field space, 
And if I write this mass in terms of the canonically normalized field, or the field that's actually measuring that distance, we see that the mass is decreasing exponentially. So that's an example. Similarly for the heterotic string, we saw that our masses um, roughly went like n divided by um, the square root of alpha prime, or n times the string mass scale. But that's exponentially small in the distance reversed by the dilaton. So alpha prime in Planck units depends on G string, which is exponential in the value of the dilaton. Okay, so these examples that we saw yesterday are uh, illustrations that kind of capture all of the features that Aguri and Vafa say are general features of moduli spaces and theories of quantum gravity. So I can't hear you. Alpha is what? Yeah. Independent of distance, right. So, so, so the claim is that um, the claim should be taken to be an asymptotic claim about large T. So the claim is at large T, there's some number alpha for which the masses are decreasing like e to the minus alpha t. It won't be exactly this, there will be corrections, but if we go to large enough t, then it'll be this where alpha is just some constant. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there are many more examples in string theory. So, um, so for example, let's say I build a three plus one dimensional gauge theory type 2B strings with D7 brains wrapped on four cycles. Okay, so something that might be phenomenologically relevant if you're trying to construct something like the standard model within string theory. In your gauge coupling, one over G squared will go like the volume of these four dimensional cycles and those volumes um, can be parameterized by some scalar fields, some Kähler moduli. And again, um, if I go a long distance in field space, if I go to very small coupling G, uh, I'm making this volume big and I'm bringing down some kaluza klein modes. Not as simple as these kaluza klein modes that live on a circle, but still some set of modes are becoming light as I make the volume big. So, um, so that's the swampland distance conjecture. And it's already a very interesting conjecture from the viewpoint of thinking about things like theories of inflation, where you might want fields to travel long distances um, over time as inflation is happening. One distinction I should point out in that context um, is the distance that appears here is the geodesic distance in field space. It depends only on the kinetic terms. Right, so I have some space of scalar fields. I know a metric on that space. I give you two points and ask you to measure the distance. You do it. 
in the usual geometric way, just using the metric. But if I have fields that are actually evolving in time, and we're not in this supersymmetric limit where I have a perfectly flat moduli space, then the fields might not actually be following geodesics in field space because there could be a potential. And the potential could change how the fields are evolving. And this might be an important distinction if we're trying to apply this to realistic theories of the real world that have SUSY breaking, where the potential can be very important for figuring out what the fields are doing. And so let me just mention two papers that discuss the swampland distance conjecture in this context and how this distinction might be important. One of these papers is by Hebecker and collaborators. Another is by Landete and Chu. And there's been various other recent work along these lines. So it's not completely straightforward to say that just because uh, Agorian Vafa tell us that if you go a long geodesic distance in field space, uh, you'll bring down a tower of modes, that uh, inflationary theories with long field ranges are excluded. You have to be a little bit careful in trying to make these kinds of arguments because these statements are really statements about the limit of exact moduli spaces, which is not the limit that's useful for the real world. Okay. So what I want to do now is circle back to the weak gravity conjecture. So you'll notice this conjecture made no reference to gauge fields. Um, we were just talking about theories of quantum gravity that contain scalar fields that act as moduli. string theory or kaluza klein theory as we've seen in examples. The values of gauge couplings are determined by the values of moduli. They're not just fixed parameters that you can't change. They depend on the values of some scalar fields. And so this starts to bring us to a link between these ideas and the weak gravity conjecture. The weak gravity conjecture grew out of the statement of no global symmetries, which was a statement that quantum gravity doesn't want you to have exact global symmetries, and therefore if I have a gauge coupling and I try to make it very, very, very small, something bad should happen. The theory should somehow break down. Well, in a lot of contexts, what happens when you try to make a gauge coupling very small is precisely that you're taking a long distance limit in moduli space. The small gauge coupling corresponds to a very big value of some scalar field. Just as happened here, includes a Klein theory. The gauge coupling was set by the value of phi. And so if you want to make a small gauge coupling, you have to go a long distance in field space. And then what Aguri and Vafa tell us is that some tower mode should start to become light. And you should worry that you're going to lose control of your field theory because you don't know about all of these modes that are coming down from the UV cutoff and entering the energy scales that you would like to calculate in. Okay, so given these ideas together with the weak gravity conjecture that I discussed before, um, it's tempting to conjecture something that's a little sharper than the weak gravity conjecture um, which is that in the case where I try to send a gauge coupling to zero, a tower of modes is going to become light. Um, 
And so in some cases, that tower of modes, as we've seen, is exactly the same tower of modes. The degree of alpha telus will become light. Okay, so just sort of trying to put these pieces together, it's tempting to guess. If I have a complete theory of gravity coupled to a gauge field with a very small gauge coupling, there must exist an infinite tower of modes of different charge Q. each one of which obeys something like the weak gravity conjecture, the mass is less than its charge in Planck units. So I'm not claiming that the statement follows from other statements that I've made. I'm just saying that given the examples that we have and given the other statements, um, it's tempting to guess that this is a general phenomenon. And so um, the statement in the sort of loose form that I've, I've written it as here is something we might call a tower weak gravity conjecture. And that particular name, um, was used in a paper by Andriolo, Jung Hans, Naomi Chu last year. We could guess something even sharper than this. And the statement that's true in, in all examples that I'm aware of is what we call a sublattice weak gravity conjecture. And this statement is some lattice of charges of gauge, uh, charges under the gauge group that is allowed. And the suggestion is there's a sub lattice of the full charge lattice. And of the same dimension. So it's not like you could have a five dimensional charge lattice and I'm picking a lattice that only goes in one of the directions, it's got to be the full dimensionality. Um, for which every site in the sub lattice contains at least one super extremal particle. So that's along the lines of the tower conjecture, but it's a little bit sharper. It's saying that these can't just have any random set of charges. There should at least be some sub lattice. So maybe it's all multiples of charge two, maybe it's all multiples of charge three, but there's some sub lattice for which you can find an example of a particle obeying the weak gravity conjecture for every site in the sub lattice. Okay, so this, um, 
This conjecture was formulated by again, Ben Heidenreich, Tom Redelius, and myself. Um, actually, we first wrote a paper I seem to be missing the exact archive number, but we wrote a paper in 2015 where we guessed that this was true for the full charge lattice. We didn't have the sub lattice part. It turned out there was a counter example, um, which I can briefly mention. And so we refined this to the sub lattice statement in a paper in 2016. And there was a simultaneous paper by Miguel Montero, Gary Hsu, and Pablo Soler with the same formulation. We were led to guess this, um, not by the logic that I was giving you here that started from thinking about the swampland distance conjecture and examples, but rather just by thinking about the, the weak gravity conjecture itself and trying to sort of stress test it and see if it was consistent. And the claim that we made in the 2015 paper is that there's sort of a flaw in the convex hull condition, the minimal version of the weak gravity conjecture, which is that I could give you a theory that satisfies it, and you could compactify that theory on a circle and get a new theory that doesn't satisfy it anymore. And the reason is the gauge group gets bigger So in my compactified theory, I now have the Kaluza-Klein charge along the circle. And as we saw, the convex hull condition tells us that when you have a bigger gauge group, it's harder to satisfy the conjecture than when you have a smaller one. You need to pull the charges farther away in order for the convex hull to enclose the, um, the black hole region. And so if I just had some particle with a sufficiently big charge to mass ratio to satisfy the conjecture in the one dimensional case, for instance, where my black holes live on this line segment. When I compactify the theory, I'm going to get a bunch of kluza klein modes of this particle. So there's going to be a mode with charge one comma one. There's going to be a mode with charge one comma two. There's going to be a bunch of other kluza klein modes that sort of accumulate close to the axis of pure kluza klein charge. And so they will have some convex hole. And then there's some black hole region. And as I've drawn it, this example looks fine. But what you find is as you vary the radius of the compactification, um, there will always be some radii for which your kaluza klein modes fail to fully enclose the black hole region. And the weak gravity conjecture can fail. Okay. So the claim is that the minimal weak gravity conjecture, the original version of it, generalized to multiple gauge groups in the natural way as Chung and Raman did, is not a completely satisfying conjecture because it's somehow not sufficient. If I, if I give you a theory that obeys it, 
You can change that theory only in the infrared by compactifying and get a theory that doesn't obey it anymore. So we noticed this in 2015 and then we went looking for examples in string theory so we could just understand how is the weak gravity conjecture satisfied in actual theories of quantum gravity. And what we found was that in all the examples that we could check, there were these towers of particles and the towers of particles rescued the statement because now we have many different particles of different charges and so they have kaluza klein modes in different locations and when you start putting them all together, you always find that after you compactify, the theory still obeys the conjecture. So, the claim is that these tower statements are more robust under compactification than the original conjecture. So that's one reason to, to think that these might be plausible statements. Another reason to think they're plausible, again, is that they connect nicely to these distance conjecture ideas of Aguri and Baffa. And a final reason This was really the main technical development in the 2016 paper that we wrote and that Montero and collaborators wrote, is that in perturbative string theory, we can actually just prove that the statement is true. And in fact, it follows from modular invariance. So it's possible to show um, just by studying a modular invariant partition function that has a chemical potential turned on uh, that charge states exist within a sublattice, and they obey a bound that looks like the weak gravity conjecture bound. Okay, so at least in perturbative string theory, this is a well-established fact. Um, of course, perturbative string theory is not all of quantum gravity, and you can ask what about particles that are charged under gauge fields that live on D-brains, for instance, and we can't really say anything about that. Although there have been some recent interesting papers showing that a class of F-theory compactifications also contain states that obey the sublattice weak gravity conjecture. These papers are by Lee, Lersch, and Weigand. So we have a lot of examples where this is just a known fact about about actual theories of quantum gravity that you can construct. Um, let's see, so I just have a few minutes left. Let me not go into detail, but just tell you the reason why it has to be a sublattice instead of a full lattice is you can just construct counterexamples where it's not the full lattice, and the flavor of these counterexamples is that you start with something that has multiple charges, like compactify on a torus, and then take an orbifold where one of the directions gets the gauge field projected out. So you no longer have a gauge field corresponding to some of the charges, but states are still labeled by some, um, some kind of momentum in that direction. It's not really conserved, but a state that had charge in that direction before you orbifold it will still have a bigger mass because of that extra momentum. And so what you can do is cook up a theory in which for certain sites in your charge lattice, the lightest state that is not projected out by the orbifold is a state that had momentum in that extra direction. And that adds to its mass, but doesn't add to its charge because we removed the charge associated with that direction. That's the flavor. Uh, you can find the details 
in the papers. Um, but the interesting thing is that in the examples that we know, where you can check what states obey the weak gravity conjecture, it's never a very sparse sublattice. So it's maybe at most half the sites in the charge lattice fail to obey the conjecture. It's never like every 10th site or every 17th site. Um, and whether that's just an artifact of looking at examples that we know how to construct or whether it's a deeper statement, I'm not really sure. Um, but to the extent that it seems to be true that this applies to sublattices that are not very sparse, this avoids the problem with the original weak gravity conjecture that you could obey it just with black holes. Right? So the original conjecture, I said you could have a small correction to an extremal black hole, and that obeyed the conjecture. But that extremal black hole has an enormous charge in order to be in the regime in which we trust semi-classical gravity. Whereas if we require this to be true for sublattices whose sparseness is only sort of an order one number, then we're going to find states of small charge that obey the conjecture, and those states are going to be lighter than the Planck scale. And so this is now telling us about actual particles, not just about black holes. Um, so again, I don't have a proof that there are no examples where this is satisfied with a sparse sublattice, um, even in the perturbative string context. But we've looked at lots of different examples of heterotic string orbifolds that we understand, and in those examples, it never was. Okay, I guess that's all for this lecture.